This is a continuation of the reading of the book by Richard Hoskins called War Cycles, Peace Cycles. As this content is related to the broader scope of understanding macro and geopolitics, I felt this to be appropriate to include as part of the Interchain FM podcast. Enjoy. Chapter 16, The Mississippi Bubble. It was called the Mississippi Bubble because the Mississippi River region was then owned by France and formed part of the company in which the initial speculation centered. It is called a bubble because most of the financing was done on borrowed money. When time came to pay, there was more money owed than there was in existence, so there was the panic and collapse which always takes place. The Mississippi Bubble is unique in that it was so big and that it took only four years from beginning to end. John Law, the man who started the plan, was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. He studied math, commerce, and political economics in London, and banking operations in Amsterdam. In 1705, he got the idea of starting a national bank in Scotland, just like the Bank of England. Patterson, another Scotsman who has been given the credit for founding the Bank of England, opposed the idea of a competing usury bank and had the plan halted in the Scottish Parliament. Law took his idea to France. While Britain was occupied with the Bank of England, France was a fertile ground for something like it. On May 20th, 1716, Law obtained a patent to establish the General Bank with 6 million shares at 4.7 livres per share. Buyers of the stock could put up one-fourth hard money and three-fourths government IOUs. This gave the bank 4.2 million livres in gold and 12.5 million livres in government IOUs. With this money in the bank, one-fourth hard money, and three-fourths IOUs, Law was then given permission to hand out banknotes to anyone who wanted to borrow money into existence. Everyone in France seemed to need money, so they came to the general bank, left their personal IOUs, and took away freshly printed paper general bank banknotes. In a short time, the bank had issued 60 million livres. Interest rates dropped to 4.5%, If a lot of money is in circulation, interest rates often drop. If a very little money is in circulation, interest rates often remain high. These notes issued by the General Bank were made legal tender by the government of France. By government decree, they were now acceptable for all debts, including taxes. This gave them true value. To expand the operation, in August 1717, the General Bank absorbed the Louisiana Company, which was a combination of the Crozet Company and the Canada Company formed in 1712. This new creation was given trading rights over the tremendous land area drained by the Mississippi, Ohio, and Missouri rivers in North America, plus trading rights in Canada. In 1718, the new expanded Louisiana Company was additionally given a monopoly on the trade over the entire region. This alone was enough to make any company wealthy. The bank's name was then changed to the Royal Bank to give it a better image. The notes of the bank were guaranteed by the king, at least he said he guaranteed them. This was a true conglomerate. In the meantime, a rival company had been formed in France called the Western Company. It was hostile to the Louisiana Company and its Royal Bank. This new company absorbed the East India, Oriental, and China companies and changed its name to the French Indies Company. This rival company was given the monopoly of the mint and coin issue for nine years and also was given the right to farm national revenues, as in collect taxes, under condition that they take over payment of the national debt. This was the sweetest deal in the world. In essence, the government of the king had abdicated and turned the government's finances over to two companies, the French East India Company and the Louisiana Company. Make no mistake about it, these two companies were the biggest things in France and probably in the world. The next thing to happen almost surpasses belief. The two companies merged. The price of the stock of this new company went out of sight. Investors were ecstatic. The merchants and farmers of France mortgaged their homes to buy stock. Burst bubble. Using past examples, we know that in theory, a usury bank does not need money to operate. A bank may open its doors without a cent. One can enter a bank, sign his IOU, and exchange it for paper money. The paper money was created by the bank employees going into the back room and printing paper banknotes. One moment, there is no money in existence. The next minute, a bank employee comes out of the back room holding a wet paper banknote by the corner so that he won't get ink on his hands. Money has just been born. 
The borrower takes the banknote and goes up the street shopping. The backing for the banknote is the borrower's IOU. The borrower may take the paper note he has just borrowed into existence and spend it. Practically, people, especially merchants, don't trust usury banks. They never have. There are very few people who would trust anyone who created money in the manner illustrated above. In the early 1700s, the only way a suspicious merchant could be persuaded to accept a bank's paper money was if he had the option to trade it for gold at any time. This is the reason John Law's bank raised 4.2 million livres in gold by selling stock. He needed the gold to be able to cash the paper banknotes. But what happened? New borrowers had come and borrowed 60 million livres worth of banknotes into existence, leaving their IOUs as collateral. Here we have 60 millions in brand new paper money in circulation and 4.2 millions in gold on reserve. A catastrophe was building. If everyone tried to cash in their paper money at one time, the bank would fold. As if the usury problem were not enough, there were other complications. The common law states, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8. This is the command against monopoly. It is one of the oldest and most constantly enforced laws. As far back as Rome, there were laws prohibiting private monopolies. The prohibition was given stimulus in Germany in 1512, when it was once more enforced. The reasons are obvious. The merchant who owns all the wheat for sale during a famine can force people to give everything they have for the wheat, or die. Whenever a group has a monopoly, sooner or later there will be trouble, usually from an unexpected direction. This great new business and banking combined in France was a monopoly, pure and simple. It controlled a large part of the commerce of the nation of France and of the world. In addition to law's monopoly, there was another monopoly. The church in France owned a third of the land and two-thirds of the capital. For centuries, the devout had been dying and leaving their estates to the church. The priests shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. The Lord is their inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 1 to 2. Instead of living on a portion of the offerings and using the remainder to administer God's business, the priests had turned the Catholic Church into a wealthy and powerful master that owned much of the best land in the country. It was also an exacting master and overseer to its employees and a keen competitor in business and politics. Many in France had good reason not to like the Catholic Church. There was a third monopoly. The crown and nobles owned another one-third of the land. The king shall not greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 16 to 17. Neither the king, nobles, nor church paid taxes. A gross misuse of authority. What floating supply of money there was, was in the hands of usury banks. These new kinds of banks had begun their operations in a big way. In 1703, there were 21 such bankers in Paris alone. In 1721 to 1751, and in 1775 to 1766. In 1709 to 1710, France had a famine. The peasants and small shopkeepers went deeply into debt to pay for imported food to keep from starving. By 1717, matters had become so bad that debts were discounted 25% by the Chamber of Justice. This was the economic background of France. Monopoly laid on monopoly. First, the king and nobles with a third of the land and their special privileges. Next, the Catholic Church owning another one-third of the land and her special privileges. This was the economic base to which John Law added his empire. France was one vast monopoly. John Law's monopoly was successful beyond anyone's imagination. People were getting rich. To get money to buy shares in Law's company, the merchants and farmers of France went to the usury banks and borrowed money into existence by the millions leaving their IOUs and the deeds to their unmortgaged property for security. On May 21, 1716, Law's plan to reduce the gold backing for paper notes was announced. This was the moment the competition was waiting for. The word was quickly spreading that the Royal Bank was going to default and that if people wanted to save themselves, they had better cash in their bills for gold immediately. Long lines formed. The gold reserves used for backing the paper money were quickly paid out. When there was no gold left, the window slammed down. The stock of the Royal Bank that had gone from 500 levers to over 18,000 plunged. 
People who had mortgaged their farms to buy stock and margin were called to pay their loans. They couldn't. By the thousands, Frenchmen bankrupted and the farms, estates, and businesses used for collateral were transferred to the bankers. The great Louisiana company was broken up and turned over to gleeful creditors. Scores of wealthy usury banks now owned the assets formerly held by one great company. The nobles, the king, and church had to move over. France was in the throes of developing a new master, the usury bank, the master who would subdue all the rest and never leave France in peace again. Chapter 17. The Bank of England. The creation of the Bank of England was the event which many economists point to as bringing modern banking to the West. This modern banking was nothing more than the old usury system brought to a virtually usury-free land. In a short time, a large part of the economic and political life of Britain was controlled by this bank, and in a while longer, much of the world. Officially, the Bank of England was founded by a Scotsman, William Patterson, in 1694. The founder stepped down the following year and others took control. This was led to the belief that Patterson was no more than a frontman. No one will ever know the true story of the activities of the first years of this bank because the Bank of England says that the minutes have been, quote, misplaced. Certain facts are a matter of public record. King William borrowed money from Amsterdam bankers to capture the throne and in the process had become their servant. The borrower a servant. He then gave a group of bankers a charter to set up an interest bank. Next, he gave this new bank his IOU for £1.2 million. The new bank allowed the king to draw on it for £1.2 million and charged him 8% a year for the privilege. In eight years at 8%, the £1.2 million debt grew to £2.2 million. Since the king didn't have £2.2 million, he couldn't pay. He made more and more concessions to the bank. The king of Britain put Britain back on the usury hook and it has remained at the hook ever since. King William could have used wooden tallies to repay the 1.2 million loan. In fact, he could have used tallies without taking a loan in the first place. It seems logical to assume that when someone pays hard money for something he could get free, it must be for a special reason. It is believed that this special reason was part of the original agreement made to the bankers back in Amsterdam in exchange for a, quote, hard money loan. The agreement must have been not to use free tallies once he became king. This may also be one of the reasons that the bank misplaced the minutes of its early meetings. One can speculate endlessly over this. In any event, in 1696, the Bank of England failed. The booms and busts had started all over again. By 1719, the national debt had grown to £51,300,000. At 8%, the interest on this amounted to £4.1 million a year, a tidy sum. In fact, it was such a tidy sum that others besides the Bank of England tried to get it. South Sea Bubble In 1711, the South Sea Company was formed in England. It was granted a monopoly of all the British trade to South America and the Pacific Islands, a highly successful and profitable business. In 1719, the directors looked around for ways to expand their operation and they spotted the Bank of England. The Bank of England was receiving over £4 million a year for holding the British debt. It didn't take any special talent to hold the British debt and receive £4 million a year for doing it. So the South Sea Company went to work to persuade the British government to turn the debt over to them and let them, quote unquote, hold it. They offered the government £3.5 million. Not only that, but they said that they would let the government reduce the interest to only £1.5 million a year instead of £4.1 million they had been paying to the Bank of England. The government debated the advisability of accepting the deal. The offer was raised to £7,567,000. The Bank of England could not match it. The government forthwith took its IOUs from the Bank of England and turned them over to the South Sea Company. This is the same as if today you offered the U.S. government a $75 billion bonus if they would let you take over the nation's trillion-dollar debt. You charge only $30 billion a year interest instead of the present $100 billion. The $75 billion bonus can come from three years' worth of interest. This is really, quote, something for nothing. The South Sea Company was now a conglomerate, just as the Louisiana Company was in France. It had the income from the South American and Pacific Islands trade, plus £1.5 million a year interest from the government's payment on its debt. The stock of the South Sea Company boomed. 
At the beginning of the year, it was 128 pound tens. By June, it had risen to 890 pounds. In July, it had risen to 1,000 pounds. To raise money, the director sold 5 million more shares at this inflated price. The stock was snapped up by eager buyers in a rush. In August, the price peaked and started down. By November, it had fallen to 135 pounds a share. Thousands who had bought on margin while the stock was high were wiped out. Hundreds fled England to avoid debtors' prison. The government investigated. They found that favors had been purchased from the government with gifts. Implicated was John Aileby, Chancellor of the Exchequer. James Craig's Joint Postmaster General, the Earl of Sunderland, and Charles Stanhope, a Commissioner of Treasury. By Act of Parliament, the estates of the accused were confiscated. What was left of the South Sea Company continued on into the 19th century. The Bank of England, whose friends had disposed of the competition, took back the government IOUs and the interest it paid yearly on the debt. Britain was right back where she started. 